You know, last night I got the chance to, uh, to give my testimony to a, to a Mormon, and I told a story of how I came to Christ and how I was a BYU sophomore reading in the Book of Romans and, and uh, trusted Christ for salvation. And then I was going on explaining how it was really lonely right at first because I didn't know anyone else that was an ex-Mormon who had left to follow Jesus. I knew lots of uh, ex-Mormons who had left to smoke and drink, but uh, none that had left to follow Jesus, and it was quite a few years actually before I found my first ex-Mormon that uh, loved Jesus. But it wasn't because of the, I told him it wasn't because I couldn't keep the word of wisdom. And <clears throat> since uh, last night I've, I've thought better of that statement and realized maybe I wasn't completely honest because I really like green tea. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, also, I heard that uh, yesterday, I just heard that thousands of people are uh, getting uh, stimulus checks from Obama and that they're dead people, that dead people are getting stimulus checks. And so I definitely wanna, don't want to go overtime today because uh, my motel's right across the street from a cemetery and I thought I'd go check that out. but. Um, <laughs> But it's fitting because so many of them voted for him, so it's okay. Okay. Um, and uh, I also heard something that you will appreciate from Christopher Hitchens, of all people. He said, uh, do you know what happens when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian? You get someone that knocks on your door to talk about not much in particular. <laughs> <clears throat> I am a fifth generation, I was born for fifth generation Mormon, so I have one generation on your rest. Um, I only know that because my mother did the genealogy. She was a family history center director for a period of time. And, um, my, I grew up in a very strong Mormon home, very active Mormon home. Um, I suppose that you know, what I can contribute not, is not my expertise so much as that I know what it feels like to be an active believing Mormon. Uh, even though it was a long time ago, I've uh, been a believer now for 36 years. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> but I really, I really know what it feels like, and it helps me to identify with Mormons on the street. Um, and not that every one of you don't have a lot to offer with your testimony, um, but I'm hoping that maybe some insights along those lines might even be of help today. Um, I'm not going to take the time to give you my whole testimony story. It's online, actually. Aaron's got it on YouTube, a couple of different uh, uh, videos of uh, me telling my story, my background, how I uh, came to faith in Christ. Uh, the short story is that I was at BYU reading the Book of Romans. I just happened to be at BYU. No thanks to BYU. But uh, uh, Romans just blew me away. You know, the gospel of grace is presented so clearly there, and it's laid out in such an organized manner that I couldn't, I couldn't miss it. And um, that's what did me in. I'm in good company. I understand that there are a lot of other uh, uh, Christians who, that have come to, to faith that way, lots of great leaders, um, Luther on down, you know, that, that Romans impact is it's an awesome book. Uh, but that central doctrine about grace uh, is what I want to talk about today, and I'm going to get get to it a little bit uh, more as we go. But um, since I became a Christian, um, something that's happened to me is that I have learned how to share my faith. Uh, that didn't happen immediately. Um, I was a Christian for quite a few years. I got involved with Saints Alive in Fresno, California. And um, our director there was involved in evangelism explosion, and he was recommending to me that I do that, that I go through that training. And that's actually where I first learned how to, how to witness, how to share my faith, how to get over my fear is probably the biggest way to describe it. And since then, um, after learning how, um, oh man, what an exciting life it is to witness and to see new life, new birth, new spiritual birth. You know, I had the great joy of seeing all four of my kids born physically. It's just as exciting to see someone born spiritually. And, you know, when I say that, I have lost count. I think it's well over 500 that 
I have had the opportunity to lead to the Lord. And I, it's not me. It's God doing it. You know, I, on my shirt it says, uh, you know, that uh, I want to save them. But I understand that I can't. I can't save them. But what I get to do is participate in Jesus' work of redemption by being there when it happens. I'm like a midwife when a birth happens, and I get to help. Some people compared it to being a salesman. That's not what it is. We're not salesmen out here. We're not going to close the deal. We're simply going to be a midwife at a birth. We don't force anything to happen. And even though I've seen so many people come to faith in Christ, um, I am definitely not pushy. I do not say, you know, make them feel pressured that they have to make a, a decision. And uh, it's just been so amazing to see so many. Probably mo the majority of them are children. I'm involved in child evangelism. But you know what? I am not a faithful evangelist. I miss opportunities all the time. I'm selfish. I don't do, I don't give the gospel when I clearly could do it because I'm doing my own thing. And I'm embarrassed to confess that, but it's the truth. And how often I've thought, you know, I've seen so many souls come to faith in Christ. What would happen if I was really faithful? Can you imagine? You know, that's every one of us has a chance. You've got family, you've got friends. We're here to witness to Mormons, and I just love coming here and being with all of you because we're all so single-minded uh, at, at the Manti pageant. We're focused, we're sold out uh, to Jesus, we're sold out to the gospel, and uh, uh, just being around you just is so uplifting. What if we did that all the time? You know, if we were at home with our families and our friends and it was just always that way, what an exciting adventure it would be. Um, I, I just, uh, I got a lot of stories. I'm going to share with you some salvation stories today. Uh, and then within all that, I want to talk about grace and works and how, how they fit together biblically. Uh, but let me start with kind of, a, um, I guess, an illustration. You guys that have been out on the streets, there's probably not a single one of you that hasn't heard this in one form or another. You're talking with a Mormon, or maybe you have a Mormon friend or something, and the Mormon may be referring to you or maybe to someone that you both know, and you, you, talk, you think about this person who is articulate and maybe good-looking, and they're accomplished, and they have a nice family, you know, great kids, all this stuff going for them. And the Mormon says, you'd make a great Mormon, wouldn't you? Have you ever heard that? How many have heard something along those lines? Gee, you'd make a great Mormon. Well, uh, first thing that occurs to me is, did it ever occur to the Mormon that they got that way without being a Mormon? <laughs> but then the other thing that came to mind about that is, you know, Mormons look at people like that and they say, you know, gee, they'd make a great Mormon. But God looks at the drunkard and the drug addict and the, the person with a, a, a divorce and a broken family and he looks at all these people that are broken and he, say, and he looks and he says, you'd really make a good Christian. Yeah. How different is the grace of God, isn't it? You know, I was an active Mormon, and yet, in God's sight, I was about as worse sinner as you could possibly imagine, because Mormonism is basically idolatry. You know, and in, in the way that the world looks at Mormons, you know, they're wonderful people, and I certainly feel that Mormons are wonderful people, because all my relatives are Mormon. All my blood relatives are Mormon. But God looks at that as, as just terrible sin, and I mean that. It's like on the order of serial killers to God, because what is the sin that God got the most angry about in the Old Testament? Isn't it idolatry? I mean, think of what he commanded Israel to do when, he came, when, when they came across idolatry, and you get a picture of how angry it makes him. He is a jealous God, and he says, you will have no other gods before me. If anybody worships a God other than the Most High God, then they're, they're an idolater. And um, more than that, you know, part of my story about how I came to Christ is an, is an awareness of sin in, inside here. You can do the outward things, you can look real good, but inside there's all that sin that we, every one of us has, you know, selfishness, pride, impure thoughts, envy, 
on and on. The list is long, and we all have that. And yet God had mercy on me. He extended his grace. And I look at my whole family, and I go, Lord, why me? I'm the only one. All these Mormons, I'm the only one. Why did you pick me to save? I will never know the answer to that question, but he chose to show his grace to me. You know, no Mormon ever comes out without it being a miracle. I'm really convinced of that. Before my mother died in, uh, in 99, I was traveling from Washington down to Southern Oregon to witness to her on weekends. Uh, she had six months to live, and so I was trying to, to give the gospel to her uh, during that time period. And as I did that, and we talked, I just realized, you know, mom had been a Mormon from birth, and, and her father had been a stake president, and every bit of her life had been Mormonism. She had callings all the time I remember growing up. And, uh, uh, you know, my family, my dad, everything, my dad had been a bishop. But when I looked at my mother in those weekends, I just thought, Lord, how can this ever happen? Her entire life is invested in Mormonism. And I've come to the conclusion that it is humanly po impossible, as, you know, as, the, as Jesus told the disciples, you know, with man, it is impossible. There is no possible way. She would have to admit that her entire life was a total waste for her to come out. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced that that's the, the, the main thing that we need to be doing is to, is to pray. Pray for Mormons that God would show them the truth because I can't convince someone who's invested their whole life that they should even consider something else because they're not going to do it. They're not going to consider something else if it's by human strength. But God showed mercy to me. Um, so when I go out on the streets, you know, like the t-shirt says, I love Mormons. They're my family. I have to love them. And I don't know if anybody could love them more than me. The, the odd thing is that when we go out there, you all know, they, they assume from the get-go that we hate them, don't they? Um, when I'm doing training, one of the things that I uh, try and convey is that our number one task when we're out there is to communicate to Mormons that we love them. Um, that's not easy um, because of how we're perceived, but that's our task nonetheless. Uh, last night, uh, I got to be with my old friend Randy Sweet, and he's the one that actually got me to go into to Manti back in 93, and I've been going ever since, except for my son's wedding last year. And uh, we were witnessing to a, a fellow, a local guy, and uh, it had been a very long conversation, just a, a wonderful conversation. And toward the end of it, Randy is talking to him, and he says, you know, we really love you guys. That's why we're here. That's why we come from the distances we do, because we really love you. And then Randy said something that kind of surprised me. He said, you know, if, if it would get you saved to cut off my right arm, I would do it. I would give up my right arm so that you could be saved. And I looked at Randy, and I said, you know what? He means it. He means it. That's how much love Randy has for Mormons. And I guess I would challenge everybody here, you know, consider your, your love for God and your love for Mormon people and pray that God would give you that kind of love. They'd be willing to give whatever it took. You know, Paul the Apostle himself said, uh, I, could, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for the sake of my, my brethren, uh, the Jews. Uh, of course, that, that couldn't be and that wouldn't save them, but that was the extent of Paul's love for for his, his brethren, and we need to have that kind of love. Um, over the years, I started speaking against Mormonism uh, back when Ed Decker had come out with The Godmakers. You remember that? It was a film. There wasn't any video at that time. It was just a film. And uh, all the way from that time on, I've had people, Christians and Mormons, both coming up and saying, why are you doing this? You know, why are you wasting your time with this? And I say, well, there's three reasons. Love, love, and love. <laughs> There can't be any other reason. If there is, it's the wrong reason. Love for God, love for Mormons, and love for the truth. So uh, that, uh, that needs to drive us. Um, also, a sense of, of being condescending, it just there's no place for it because we're sinners saved by grace. And we don't stand above the Mormons and say, we have all this wisdom we're going to impart to you down there. you know. Uh, but rather, um, 
they explain it in Evangelism Explosion. We're like one beggar showing another beggar where we found bread. You know, that's really what we are. We do not deserve it. It is by grace that we are saved. Um, before I talk more about grace, I want to refer just a little bit to last night, um, the impossible gospel presentation that uh, Keith gave. Just fantastic. Uh, Keith has really honed that thing down. And he's, he's got so many great... Uh, zingers there that uh, the one the one you forgot I, I mentioned to you was that quote from Joseph Smith that you brought up uh, before and uh, does everybody know this quote from Joseph Smith uh, it's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith page 148 repentance is a thing that cannot be trifled with every day daily transgression and daily repentance is not that which is pleasing in the sight of God that's a good one to remember you might want to write that one down so I'm just kind of tacking that on because that was such a great presentation yesterday. And what our group has done uh, for a number of years is really the same thing. Keith gave it a label, the impossible gospel. It's a great, a great uh, description of it. Um, and it, it's, it's helpful because in the old days, the way we did it, it was we used apologetics. And when I came in 93, almost everybody did apologetics, which s simply means to make a defense. And uh, we'd have these huge arguments out on the street. You know, you'd go out there, and all you had to do was start talking to one Mormon on the street, and pretty soon, pfft, you know, you've got uh, 50 of them around you, and they're shouting at you, and all this is going on, and you're arguing about whether Joseph Smith was a money digger or, you know, whatever it is we were, we were debating. And what we kind of learned over the years, um, I think pretty much all of us kind of at the same time realize, you know, we might win an argument. We, we don't win a soul. And uh, so we started to to think back, you know, well, what is it that we're really talking about here? Well, it's the forgiveness of sins. That's what we want for Mormons. That was the call that, that God gave to, to Paul when he was going out, and you know, it's in Acts 26, um, that uh, it was to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins. Um, the forgiveness of sins is everything. If we have the forgiveness of sins, we have everything. Nothing is well withheld back, withheld from us. Um, we're heir to all the treasures of heaven. If we don't have the forgiveness of sins, we've got nothing. Mormons have temples, they have priesthood, they have forever families, whatever else they think they have, and none of it means a hill of beans if they don't have the forgiveness of sins. My mother was after me when I was making those trips down there, and <clears throat> she said, Mark, I just... I wish so much that you could be resealed to us in the temple so we could be together as a family. And I said, Mom, even according to Mormonism, being sealed in, as a family only applies in the celestial kingdom. And you don't meet the requirements. None of us meet the requirements. So we're not going to be there anyway. So what good does it do to go through a ceremony? The ceremony is the easy part. You know, obtaining the forgiveness of sins is what really counts. I think she had to confess that, yeah, the forgiveness of sins really is the central point. So the, the uh, uh, impossible gospel presentation is, you know, focuses on that issue, the forgiveness of sins. And if you ever get confused, I don't care whether you're witnessing to Mormons or anyone else, <clears throat> if you're out there witnessing and, um, you know, you kind of lose track of the conversation where we're going, come back to the forgiveness of sins. That'll always get you back on track. What is it that you're doing it for anyway? You want them to be forgiven, like you are, right? And, you know, that one thing, that, that one little secret, that one little nugget will make such a difference in your, in your witnessing life if you keep focus on, uh, on what it's all about. Um, there's one other thing that, that Keith brought up yesterday that I want to piggyback on. He was talking about how this one Mormon was saying, well, it's a time, this is a time issue. You, you've introduced a time factor. I forget exactly how it went. But, uh, yeah, that's really important. And I've been thinking about that recently. We understand that we are saved by grace and that the forgiveness is for all sin for all time. Hebrews 10.14 says that, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. We're pardoned of future sins. We're pardoned of past sins. We're pardoned of future sins. Uh, <clears throat> Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was one of the things I became aware of is that when Jesus had nails pounded into his hands, he saw my sin in 2009. And he died anyway for me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
He sees my sin in 2010, and I haven't even done it yet. But he still died for that sin too. We understand that, but you know what? Mormons don't. That's one of those things, they just don't get that at all. <clears throat> that really came out in our conversation last night with this, this Manti gentleman. We had actually gone on, it was a, it was a fantastic thing because um, the night before we had spent uh, probably two hours, no, we spent three hours with him because we did an hour until the pageant ended and then we stayed and talked another two hours. And uh, at the end, I gave him one of my, my yellow tracks that really talks about the very same uh, presentation method you're, we're talking about. And uh, then yesterday, we got out on the streets, and right at the very beginning, who walks up? The same gentleman, and he's holding out the yellow tract, and he says, I read this, and I have some questions. <laughs> and we had this amazing discussion from there. He really is a truth seeker. And as we got to... Uh, on towards the presentation, and we shared how, how this grace is extended to us that even our future sins are forgiven, past, present, future, we have a total pardon. And he just kind of went, future sins? It was a foreign concept to him. Mormons don't get that idea that they can be forgiven for future sins. And one of the things we do when we're talking about this, we have right inside the front cover, is this question, do you know that you're forgiven? It's great to start off uh, with a few introductory things and then get to that question. You know, well, do you know that you're forgiven of your sins? And uh, it used to be that no Mormon would ever say yes to that. Um, but we, then we started to get more and more that would say, well, yes, I'm forgiven. Um, and what they were doing, you could almost see things working in their minds. They were justifying it in their mind. They were rationalizing, well... I have to stop my sin to be forgiven, and right now I'm not doing any sinning, so yes, I, I guess I'm forgiven of my past sins, so okay, yes, I'm forgiven. But then you start probing a little further and you find out, well, no, they're not really forgiven because the future sins are still out there, and their nature, their sin nature is still there, so nothing's been solved at all. But if you're talking to Mormons about forgiveness, I would encourage you to go there, go to the future sins. Talk about the fact that he has perfected us forever, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in advance for those sins that were, were in the future. If we're only forgiven for past sins, what good is that? We're sinners. You know, we're sinners because, or we uh, are sin, what, sinners because of our nature. We're not sinners just because we sin. We have that nature. And, and no Mormon has any assurance because that's why they say we have to endure to the end. Well, they know they're not going to do that because they're blowing it every single day. Take the sacrament this week, as you said. You know, they have to keep repeating and repeating and repeating, just like Hebrews talks about the repeating sacrifices in the temple. The work's never done. But when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And he, the, the work was done, even for future sins. That doesn't mean it's okay to do future sins. It just means we're pardoned of them. We are reconciled to him. Reconciliation, a pardon, forgiveness, that's all, we're all talking about the same thing. <clears throat> then there's the, uh, the whole idea of cause and effect that gets so confused. And this also has to do with the time issue, uh, bringing time into it, is what causes what? What is it that is the criteria for this? And uh, Mormons are very confused about that because we will talk about things in one way and they talk about it in another. And sometimes I, I kind of get to the point by saying this. My Mormon friend, you and I both believe in the forgiveness of sins, and you and I both believe that we should live righteously. But here's the difference. You believe that you must live righteously in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins. And I believe that you must have the forgiveness of sins before you can really please God and live righteously. The order is the problem. It's not the doctrine itself. Of, of the of the actual things, you know, the forgiveness, the righteousness, we're agreed on that we those are good things, but it's the order, what causes what, and this is at the heart of everything. Now, <clears throat> you remember in uh, in the Book of Mormon, Second Nephi, twenty five, uh, was it twenty five, twenty three, um, that we know that uh, uh, it is by grace we're saved. After all, we can do. After all, we can do. 
Now, that verse sounds strangely familiar because it's out of Ephesians, where we know that it's by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for he, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Ephesians has it completely reversed. You receive the grace, and that results in the good works that God prepared for us to do. In Second Nephi, you have to do the good works, and then you get the grace. By the way, the grace is only partial grace, because it's only for past sins. Um, this kind of brings then in the, uh, oh, wait a minute, before I go get off the cause and effect thing, uh, a little story, I was um, going to a physical therapist, I've had some back problems, and a physical therapist was having me do some exercises, and it turned out he was a, a very active Mormon, he was the elders quorum president in his ward, and he was actually just in the process of, of changing his calling, he was becoming a seminary teacher, and very knowledgeable about Mormonism. And so when he discovered that I was an ex-Mormon, he got real excited and he thought, ah, I got one, I'm going to get this guy. And I uh, thought he had, he had all the answers and we began talking and he started to realize, oh, you know, he knows a little more about Mormonism than I, I thought. And I don't think he's, he'd ever run into anybody that, that really knew uh, the scriptures. And uh, so I quoted to him uh, Moroni 10:32 and 33. And he says, well, um, the Bible t says that we should deny ourselves all ungodliness. There's nothing wrong with that verse. The Bible says we should do it. And uh, I said, well, where are you talking about? He says, well, in Titus. He couldn't give a reference, and I couldn't recall the exact verse he was talking about, but I said, well, I can tell you this. I know that it says that we should deny ourselves on all, of all ungodliness because we're saved, not to get saved. And so, the first chance I had, I looked it up, and sure enough, that's exactly what it says. Titus 2, 11 to 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath, um, in King James, obviously, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What is it that teaches us? Yeah, the salvation, the, the grace, that's right. That's what teaches us about uh, denying ourselves ungodliness. We don't argue with Mormons about whether or not we should deny ourselves of all ungodliness. Of course we should, but not to get the remission of sins, which is what the verse says in Moroni 10, 32, and 33. You had a question about that? 32 and 33? Yeah, if you look at, at uh, verse 33, it's almost better to look at it in reverse, I think, because in verse 33, it speaks of becoming holy without spot, having the remission of sins, and you read that and you go, yeah, good, that's what we want, that's what we need, right? Remission of sins. And they say, okay, now I see that in the Book of Mormon, let me find out how you get it. So you back up a little bit to verse 32, and you go, oh, you have to deny yourself all ungodliness? All, I mean, he talked about that yesterday. All means all. It doesn't mean 80%. doesn't mean 70%. All and godliness. That's basically saying that you have to repent as Mormons define repentance and stop all your sins permanently. And that kind of brings us to the, uh, the nutshell statement. And some of you, I've talked about this uh, a couple years ago, uh, but I find that Mormons are very confused about their own gospel. Some talk about grace. Some talk about works. And they, they get very confused themselves about what they, they even believe. And so I came up with this nutshell statement so that we can um, communicate to them and also so that we understand. In a nutshell, in Mormonism, before you can be forgiven of a particular sin by the atonement, you must successfully stop that sin permanently. So in order to be forgiven of all sin, which you must, we must successfully stop all sin permanently. That is the Mormon gospel. If you get off track, if a Mormon leads you down this trail and that trail, keep that in mind. No, what the church teaches is this, that you have to stop all sin to be forgiven of all sin. That's how they define repentance. And that's one of the things that they have twisted, is taken that word repentance, and they've made it very strict that uh, involved in it is, you know, the five steps that Spencer W. Kimball laid out, 
and the toughest of which is to stop your sin permanently. And actually, point number five says you have to live all the commandments of the Lord. Um, nobody's ever done that. You can't stop all sin permanently. Well, actually, we could, but we don't, right? None of us. We all have a sin nature. We don't. Um, so the gospel of Mormonism is a hopeless gospel. You know, Romans 1.16 says that um, we, we are not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. But the Mormon gospel has no power to save that's a hopeless gospel. Um, the passage in uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenants 1 uh, that says, he will not look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. That is basically the same nutshell statement, really almost in one verse. But that's the Mormon gospel. That's the hopeless gospel of Mormonism. So before we can really talk about grace, we need to have a perspective. What do we believe about grace and works? What do Mormons believe about grace and works? And we need to have that figured out before we go talking to them because that's going to be at the heart of this message of the forgiveness of sins. So um, if you don't have one, actually we've been giving these out so much, I'm not sure if we have enough uh, to go around here, but uh, they're <clears throat> available uh, through my website, exmormon.net. And you, you have some more there, Brian? If anybody wants them, see Brian, he's got some. And... Uh, <clears throat> And we've got some others here, too. In fact, I'll talk about that here in a second. But when you talk to Mormons about this issue of how they obtain the forgiveness of sins, now, by the way, that quote is not theirs, it's mine, but you can refer them to DNC 1, and that is theirs, and it says virtually the same thing. Um, and if you weren't here, how many of you were not here the last time I spoke a couple years ago? Okay, quite a few. Um, I pointed out that I took this statement to, to Temple Square. I talked to, on two different occasions, once I talked to um, the uh, mission president at Temple Square, and uh, uh, we actually got into it. I got into a little bit of a debate with the, a sister missionary about whether or not the church teaches that. And so she suggested that we go in and talk to the mission president. And I said, I'd be delighted. That sounds good. So we went in there, and... I laid out the question, in Mormonism, to be forgiven of a sin by the atonement, you must successfully stop the sin permanently. To be forgiven of all sin, you must stop all sin permanently. Now, does the church teach that or not? And he pointed at her and he, he said, you're wrong. And he pointed at me and he said, you're right. And I said, whoa. You know, I, I really felt this way because I really felt hopeless because uh, as a Mormon, I couldn't do this. And the mission president, now I think he supervises some 500 sister missionaries, I'm not sure exactly. He said, uh, yeah, I really understand what you're saying. For a long time, I felt the same way. I felt really hopeless. And I said, well, how did you deal with it? He said, well, I, um, um, uh, well, um, um, well uh, I just don't think about it anymore. The mission president, Temple Square, that's his solution to the hopelessness of the impossible gospel. He doesn't think about it anymore. How nice. You know, sadly, that's basically what most Mormons are doing out there. <laughs> they just try not to think about it. And that's their solution to their, their impossible gospel. And our task is to not let them go to sleep, but to wake them up and say, come on, look at what your doctrine is. It's not my gospel, it's your gospel. And sometimes when you do that, you get into the cycle where the Mormon will go, well, that's what the atonement's for. And you say, no, wait a minute. We're talking about how to get the atonement in the first place. First, you have to get the atonement in order to use the atonement to get the atonement again. You know, I mean, it's, they try and turn it into the cycle, and you go around and around and around. And, and after you do that, they, won't, they often won't get it right away. But finally, you can see it starts to go in their brain, and they start tilting their head. And, and sometimes you see a little smoke coming out their ears. And... Blue screen, you know, <laughs> that blue screen of death, you know, it's kind of what you see, we were talking about that last night. If that happens, perfect, you know, that's exactly where you want them. If they're, uh, if they're spacing out like that and they understand that something is not right, that means they're thinking. And a lot of times Mormons will just have to, to uh, chew on that for a while. It might even be a couple of years they'll have to chew on it. It's okay. Like, uh, Keith was saying, I agree completely. Don't go too fast. Let them get lost first, because it won't do you any good to talk about grace um, if they're not ready. 
They need to see how hopeless they are first. Um, okay, grace. Do we really have a handle on it ourselves? Sometimes Mormons are hitting us with things. You know, faith without works is dead is, of course, the one we've all heard. And I've seen so many Christians out there stumble at that point. They don't really know how to answer it. Or the Mormon will say, oh, so all, now that you have grace and you know you're going to heaven, now you can just go out and kill someone and you're still going to heaven, right? Who, who hasn't heard that? Has anybody not heard that? <laughs> You know, we've all heard that kind of thing. But then I see the Christians stumble in their answer. Well, oh no, you can't commit murder. And, sorry. I was putting this up here for my time. Um, so I, I do want to talk about that issue of grace, but we need to understand, we, we need to be rock solid and understand that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the message is not complicated. It's extremely simple. Jesus paid the debt through the blood of his cross so he would have authority to forgive sins. And he offers us this forgiveness. And we have a response. Do we say yes or no? It's that simple. Man, this is... thought I had it turned off. Excuse me. Maybe it'll be this time. And uh, I, I told you I was involved in, uh, in evangelism explosion and also in child evangelism fellowship. And I love to go to the fairs uh, with CEF and witness to the children. And I can just tell you some amazing stories about how children understand things and they, they understand the gospel. And we use something called the wordless book. Many of you have probably heard of it. I probably should have brought one. Um, but um, I've been doing this for a long time, did it again this year. And last summer, a year ago last summer, uh, I had been especially using the wordless book as a way to present the gospel to children. And it's basically, you know, you open it to the gold page. They say the gold page reminds us of heaven, and it's where God is. And then you lead from that into the black page that talks about the darkness of sin, and you explain how we all sin. Then you turn to the red page, and you talk about Jesus' blood and how Jesus took our punishment. And children follow this right through. And then the white page represents how he's washed our record book white as snow, it's totally clean uh, if we will make that decision to trust, to believe. And if we do that, then we begin to grow. And the last page is the green page. And the colors are really great for the children because then it helps them to remember. And remembering is really the biggest obstacle with kids. And they do remember. I could, uh, wish I had time to tell you some stories about uh, just amazing things about how kids remember. But I'd had this experience last summer in one particular fair where I think it was like 13 children had accepted the Lord, and I was just floating. You know, I was so excited. And uh, it was in the fall after that then uh, our director, Rich Berghammer, got a phone call from a Mormon uh, down in Olympia. We're in Tacoma. And uh, this Mormon was, was struggling and had a lot of questions, and so he wanted to um, get some answers. So uh, we arranged to have a meeting with Corky. And when it was a halfway point. We got there to this restu uh, restaurant. It was a taco time. And uh, we started talking and uh, answered a number of his questions. And then I, I commented to him that uh, I had been sharing the gospel with children, the gospel of grace, and it really was quite simple. And I said, Corky, you know what I told them? I told them that the gold page stands for heaven. It's where God is, and God is the creator. He created us, and he gave us freedom to choose, just like he has, can make choices, we can make choices. But we chose to sin. And I flipped to the back page, the black page, and I said, and then I was telling the kids how the black page uh, explains about sin and how um, we have all kinds of sin. We have sins that we do. We have sins of omission when we fail to do things. We have sins of shooting off our mouth. We have sins of having wrong thoughts, even. And then I told the children that Jesus is God, and he came to earth specifically to do something that he could only do as a man, and that was to die and pay our, take our punishment, to pay our debt on the cross. And I was you know, talking about the red page. I said, and then I told the children, of course I'm telling Corky, that the white page represents the forgiveness of sins and how he wants to pardon all of our sins, past, present, and future. And all you need to do is to trust Jesus to take it away. And it's a decision you make. Corky, what do you think? 
would you like to make that decision? And he's listening, hanging on the edge of his seat, and he says, yeah. So I led a Mormon to the Lord with the wordless book. That's how simple it is. It's not complicated. It's a gift that's offered to us, and it is no strings attached. Sometimes we're afraid to say that. No strings attached. It's a gift. He paid all the price. No price left to pay. Do we say yes and mean it, or do we, or do we reject it and walk away? Corky said yes and, uh, and came to faith in Christ um, last fall. What about grace and works? How does that all fit together? We, the first thing we hear is, is James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. As Christians, how, how does it all fit together for us? You know, I, it's very common. We had it last night where, where the Mormon is saying, well, works is important. You have to do works. You know, we, we, uh, you can't just say works aren't important. And he starts rattling off all these verses where Jesus said to, to do the right thing, whether it's the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount or uh, whether it's talking about how, you know, if you do it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. And so God and Jesus gives commandments and we're supposed to do it. How can you say that's not important? I said, I never, ever said it was not important. But it's not required to be saved. And it's a hard message to get across, but that is the doctrine that we believe. Works are absolutely important. They are. We must do good works, but not to get saved. Um, the illustration I give, uh, I give a, a parable where um, maybe some of you have heard me uh, tell this, where we're, I'm standing with my Mormon friend on the deck of a ship out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the railing breaks, and we fall in the water. And the ship sails on. They don't notice initially that we've fallen into the water. And we're in trouble. And I'm, I'm there tre treading water with my Mormon friend. And I say, George, you know, what are we going to do? Well, I guess all we can do is swim. Where? Well, you know, China is that way. Let's kind of swim that direction. You know, we're swimming, but we know it's hopeless. The water's warm. The water's calm. We know how to swim. For the moment, we're okay, but there we are. Meanwhile, the ship realizes that the railing is broken and that we're missing, so they call for help. They radio for the uh, ships, to rescue ships to come searching, and they, fi they find us. And when they find us, amazingly, they do, and then they throw out a life ring, and I grab the life ring, and they pull me up on the deck. And then I say, George, grab the life ring. And George says, that's too easy. I had Mormons tell me two different times here just in the last couple of nights, that's too easy. Well, then grab the life ring if it's so easy. You know, I mean, if you're out there, you know, in the water, maybe you're not drowning, but you know you can't swim to China, so why not grab the life ring? Jesus, of course, is the life ring. And the ocean is the ocean of our sin. And you know what? Our sin is bigger than the Pacific Ocean. So it's, it's not a bad analogy at all. And then George says, well, but I'm, I'm swimming here, and I, you can't deny I'm getting closer to China with every stroke. No, George, I can't deny it. But it's too far. You can't get there. George, please grab the life ring. And then George says, stop discouraging me. You're just discouraging me. I'm improving my stroke. I'm getting better at this. Now just stop discouraging me. Does that make any sense? You know, of course, you know, let's, let's go home and, and practice in the pool. Swimming is a wonderful thing. That's good works, right? Swimming is good works. It's good. We all should do it. We need to learn how to do it better. But let's do it in the pool. This, you know, swimming is not for the purpose of crossing the Pacific Ocean. It has a purpose, but that's not it. Same way with good works. It has a very important purpose. And then, and then this gentleman said, well, well, what's it for then? What's the purpose? I said, there's two purposes. Number one, God gives his commandments to us because he is telling us what his nature is. He's explaining to us how righteous he is and what his standard of perfection really means. The, you know, Paul said that it is our schoolmaster. It teaches us about who God is and what he demands of us. But it doesn't save us any more than taking a mirror, which also shows us our sin, is used to wash our face with. I do, do that with the children, by the way. I'll take a, a smear dirt on my face and I'll walk out there and, uh, and say, you have a dirty face. 
And I say, I do? I can't see it. And they said, no, you do. And I say, well, where is it? I'm looking, but I don't see my dirty face. They say, you need to look in a mirror. So I get a mirror and I look, oh, I have a dirty face. And they uh, I better get that cleaned off, don't you think? Yeah. So I take the mirror and I start rubbing it on my face. And they say, no, you can't wash your face with a mirror. Bingo. You can't wash your face with a mirror. You have to have the blood of Jesus to wash away the sin. So, But then there's a second purpose of God's commandments, and that is that when we trust him, we love because he first loved us. We respond to that, and we want to honor him. Maybe for the first time we really want to because we get to instead of because we have to. And so we want to know, don't we? Isn't that really what we want to know about God's law? Um, uh, David talked about how he loved the law of the Lord. Why did he love it? Because he wants to honor God. He wants to know how to do it. So that's the second purpose of God's commandments. There's very good reasons for God's commandments, but it isn't to get us across the Pacific Ocean. So uh, we're, we need to understand that for ourselves, what the role of works and grace is, and then we want to teach that to Mormons and explain it. So what happens when they say faith without works is dead and they bring you to James chapter 2? Well, what I tell them is let's read the text. Let's, let's go through the context. If you have James chapter 2 opened up, you might want to follow along. What's our deadline, Chip? Is it noon? Okay, good. So we're, we're okay. I, I need to know when I go to the cemetery to check for the checks, you know. Okay. Um, let's pick it up in verse 17. Even so, if it hath not works, it is dead, being alone. Um, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. <coughs> Wilt thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? It doesn't end there, does it? It keeps going. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, or complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers, and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, Luther didn't like this chapter. He didn't like this book. He, he, he really would have preferred that it wasn't part of the canon. But Luther didn't understand it, or he would have loved it. Because actually, the message here is grace all the way. Look at what he's saying. He is saying that Abraham and Rahab are examples of what he's trying to communicate here. Okay, let's look at Abraham and Rahab. Number one, they're both sinners. You remember? I mean, Abraham said, she's my sister. Don't hurt me. You know, I mean, he was pretty cowardly. Uh, and, uh, oh, well, I guess you're not going to give me that son you promised, so I'll go sleep with uh, um, Hagar. <laughs> you know, Abraham was not particularly righteous. Actually, Mormons have kind of this view that Abraham never did anything wrong. He did lots of stuff wrong. But he had faith. He trusted God. God had promised him so much, a land, a seed, a blessing. Your descendants will be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And later he says, through, through Isaac will your seed be called. And he said this special seed would be one that would bless all the nations of the Of course, he was pointing to Jesus. But it would come through Isaac. And uh, in chapter 15 of Genesis, we have this scripture that says Abraham believed God and his faith was counted as righteousness some chapters later chapter 22 we read about Abraham taking his son Isaac out of obedience to God up the mountain and he ties him up instead of the lamb he raises his knife over his son that's Abraham's work does James want us to kill our sons does he want us to raise knives obviously not 
He's communicating something here. Abraham trusted God so much that he acted on it. God had already declared him righteous in chapter 15. In chapter 22, Abraham finally had the opportunity to put his money where his mouth is, so to speak. And God had told him what to do, and Abraham didn't flinch. He thought, according to Hebrews, it says that he thought that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead because God had promised not only that he would have a, you know, a multitude of descendants, but that it would be through Isaac. So he thought God would have to raise him from the dead because God cannot break a promise. You know, that's what God's grace is, is that he does not break his promise. It says in Hebrews, he is faithful who promised. So that's, it. that's Abraham's work. And uh, specifically, we know that this is the point that uh, James was making because uh, he describes the, the, uh, the promise, you know, that... that um, he was declared righteous by his works, or by his um, faith. And, but then he says, so in a sense, he was, he was justified by his works when he raised the knife over his son because the scripture was fulfilled. That word fulfilled is very important. What is fulfilled? Which scripture is fulfilled? The one in chapter 15 that says, Abraham believed God and his faith was counted as righteousness. So when Abraham acted on his faith, he was vindicating that. He was vindicating God, really, because God had already declared him righteous, but Abraham's actions showed that he had the faith that God knew he had back then. How about Rahab? What was her work? First of all, who was she? Prostitute. Oh, real good example, James. You want us to live righteously and you give us an example like that? Well, what was her work? She lied. Okay, is that what we're all supposed to do? Faith without works is dead. Let's all go out and lie. No, of course not. What we see clearly is that Rahab was among this people in Jericho that did not trust God, and Rahab had heard about all the mighty works of God that was, were happening through the nation of Israel, and she turned to that God and trusted that God, and her actions showed that she trusted that God because she took the side of the spies, and when her own soldiers came in, she says, they went that away when they really went that away. And so Rahab demonstrated her faith by her deeds. Deeds are important, and our actions do verify that the faith that we have that saved us is real. Faith without works is dead. But Mormons take that to mean that uh, works is faith, and that the only way you ever... Um, have faith is if you're doing all these works. They misunderstand the whole point that James is making. Um, if you turn to Galatians chapter 2, we have this statement. Verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And yet we just read in James that uh, verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son? Is that a contradiction? It sure seems like it if you just take the verses out of context, but understanding what we do about the book of James, it absolutely is not a contradiction. What James is saying is, yes, you know, Galatians is true. We're, we're not justified by the works of the law, but there is a sense in which our works justify us because they are validating that we have the faith. It's the faith that justifies us. It's the works that shows that it's there. So it is not a contradiction if you look at the context of the whole thing. Now let me give you another example of, of where we see what seems to be a contradiction, and it's absolutely not. You're probably familiar with the passage that in Romans 10 that says, uh, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, no, I mean, it says, uh, um, confess with your mouth, uh, believe in your heart, and uh, uh, believe in your heart, then... Uh, Yes, then what? What? Then you'll be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, can you think of another verse in the Bible where it talks about calling on the name of the Lord? As a Mormon, I did. Luke, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 7. Let's turn there. Matthew 
Let's start with uh, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hold it right there. Romans 10 says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here it says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into my kingdom. What's going on here? Is this a contradiction? What do you do when the Mormon talks about this? They say, no, 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 and not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, you can't just get fire insurance by saying, Lord, Lord. This is, you know, this is uh, what it's supposed to be. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, uh, but he who do doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now that really sounds like works too, right? Okay, again I say, let's keep reading. Let's don't stop there. The question that we would have when we read this is he says, many who say, Lord, Lord. That means that some who say, Lord, Lord, will be saved, but many who say, Lord, Lord, won't be saved, right? He's not saying all who say, Lord, Lord, won't be saved. He says many who say, Lord, Lord, won't be saved. So which ones are they? That's an obvious question. He's going to answer that question right here in the text. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And we're kind of scratching our head and going, huh? How is that iniquity? How is that bad works? He just told us that we have to do the will of our Father. And here, the, 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 weren't they doing his will? They were casting out demons and doing these wonderful works and everything? What's going on with that? What was the problem with what they were doing? They were justifying themselves by works. They were standing before God and saying, Lord, look at me. Look at all the good stuff I did. I did this and that. I'm a really good person, so you should let me into your kingdom. Lord, Lord. That's what they were doing. What, was, what would it be to do the will of the Father? Would the will of the Father be to brag, to boast? Remember Ephesians? Lest anyone should boast. It's completely by grace, lest anyone should boast. What are these people doing? They're boasting. Sorry, I'm getting away from the microphone. <laughs> They're boasting. That is the sin. That is the iniquity. I've got to tell you, I got personal experience with this. When I became a Christian, I wanted my mom and dad to be okay. I love my parents. They were wonderful parents. And they did the best they could in teaching me Mormonism because that's all they knew. But you know what? I came to the conclusion after studying it, I just can't say it. They're not okay. My parents are going to hell. You think I like saying that? I don't like saying that. But it's God's word. It is iniquity. When I was down visiting my mother during those last months of her life, I shared the gospel with her a number of times. And I asked her, wouldn't you like to receive the forgiveness of sins as a free gift by making a decision to trust him right now today? She says, no. I said, well, what would you say to God if you stood before him? She said, well, I'd stand there and say, well, you know, I did a lot of stuff for you. I, I was a genealogy, you know, family history center director, and I've been Relief Society president. I've done a lot of, a lot of things in the church all my life. Um, so that's why you should let me into heaven. She said that. <laughs> Look at this. I mean, how can I possibly say my mother's going to heaven? I want to say she's going to heaven. But the scripture says you cannot stand in God's presence and take any of the credit for being there. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, lest anyone should boast. The very iniquity that Jesus was talking about, the very going against his will that Jesus was talking about, is what these people were doing. Some Mormons will try and say, well, there must have been something else they were doing wrong. It's not in the text. There's no explanation we have in this text that they were doing something else, that they were secretly sinning over here while they were saying this. 
Nowhere in the text. All we have in the text is that they were doing this good stuff, but that they were boasting about it. Their sin is that they were boasting about it. Now, if I only took that in isolation, you know, maybe they'd have a certain argument to make, but it's not an isolation. If you turn to, uh, to Luke chapter um, 18, Jesus explains this point again. I can find it here. It's kind of dark in this room and I don't have my reading glasses. Okay. Jesus gives a parable. Two men went up into the temple. This is verse 10, okay? Chapter 18. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican or tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as that publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote again his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Does that not say exactly what Matthew 7 just told us? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So Jesus actually spells it out, you know, right in the context that that is the point he's trying to make. Although the point is pretty unmistakable as you read it. And uh, so if, if uh, your Mormon friend doesn't want to take your interpretation of, of uh, Matthew 7, you can point him to that, that uh, parable. Um, on Wednesday when I arrived in Salt Lake, I had a little bit of time before I came here. So I went to uh, Temple Square and uh, I was... Uh, able to talk to a sister missionary there who happened to be a senior citizen sister missionary, Sister Carlson. And uh, she re reminded me of my mother because my mother did exactly the same thing. She actually served two missions as a, as a senior. And uh, so we started a discussion about the forgiveness of sins and uh, got to share the gospel with her a little bit. And uh, she was very you know, s strong in, in what she was saying too. She, was, she wasn't really giving an inch. And I had my car parked, uh, you know, in the, the place where you put the coins in, so I was under a time constraint, and so I said, well, you know, I need to, I need to cut this short, but uh, let me leave you with, with this. And it was Pascal's wager. We've talked about this in, in the uh, way we do it with Mormons. I said, if, if uh, you and I, um, or, or if you're right and I'm wrong, then, then you and I will both be in the terrestrial kingdom. Uh, and I was about ready to go on with the rest of it, and she stopped me, and she said, no. No, I'll be above you. I just thought, holy cow, she actually said that? <laughs> and I said, please, you know, and I'm saying this as I'm leaving, I said, please take a look at the parable in Luke chapter 18. And she says, don't quote scripture to me anymore. <laughs> there are a few of those Mormons that are really self-righteous and they really think they've arrived. She was sure that she was above me and that... Uh, you know, she's, she's one of the very ones that, that uh, it's talking about there in, in uh, chapter 7 of Matthew. So, so we see that if, if we say, Lord, Lord, if we call upon him as it is in Romans 10, then we will be saved. But if we call upon him like the people in Matthew 7, we won't be saved. What's the difference? One, you're calling on the Lord for mercy, just like the tax collector. In the other, you're calling upon the Lord to boast, to take credit. What happens when you take credit? You're taking glory away from God. And all the glory goes to him. He did everything on the cross. The finished work of Jesus upon the cross is what saved us. Um, by the way, you know, not only is it true that faith without works is dead, did you also know that works without faith is dead? In, in uh, Romans 14, it says, whatever is not of faith is sin. And that was the point I was getting at earlier. When, when you say to a Mormon, we both believe in the forgiveness of sins, we both believe in living righteously, but you must live, you, you, you can't get forgiveness by living righteously. Rather, 
You must have the forgiveness of sins before you can live righteously in a way that pleases him. Whatever is not of faith is sin. So God transforms us. He changes us. And what happens when, when he saves us? By grace. By grace alone. No strings attached. What happens? Do we want to go out and kill people? I don't know about you. I don't, that's not what happened to me. I didn't run out and say, oh, good, i got fire insurance now. I'll just start sinning all I want. Now I've got a license to sin, you know, like James Bond. No, it's not what happens. But the question is, can you go out and murder and you'll still go to heaven? I've seen so many Christians say, oh, no. What do you mean, oh, no? How did you get saved? Was it by your works? How did Paul get saved? How did David get saved? David was, Paul was a murderer. They got saved by grace. And even future sins, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, am I saying that we can go out and kill people? Well, we're not supposed to go out and kill people, no. And if we love God, which we do, if he loves, we love because he first loved us, that's not what we go out and do. But, you know, I actually have reflected on some of the Christians who were soldiers in the army for Germany at the time when Hitler took power. And I know that some of these Christians that were in the Nazi army really had some struggles. And there were some who committed crimes. They committed atrocities before maybe they finally realized that they just can't go this direction. But yes, there have been Christians who have murdered. And they're saved. They are saved because we're saved by what he did on the cross not by what we do. That's one of the most awesome things to me about being a Christian. If I have a bad hair day, it's still okay. <laughs> and I have them all the time. You know, don't we all have our bad days when we really mess up and we go, oh man, am I really saved? How could I be saved if I'm doing this? If I'm having these kind of thoughts, they shouldn't even, they shouldn't even be there. You say, I must not be saved. Yeah, you can be saved. In fact, you are saved if you've made that decision to trust him. It just means you need to hold on tighter. Uh, i give the, uh, an example of that. And I'm going to um, move, I guess, from the, the Bible teaching to uh, a story that happened uh, a year and a half ago. Um, I have a website, exmormon.net, and... Uh, I have a lot of Mormons that write to me emails, and we have conversations. And over the years, I've had a number of Mormons come to the Lord through the through the website. And uh, I got this email one time that led to a discussion by email over a three-day period. It was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And and I want to read it to you. I'm, I'm going to skip over some parts just for the interest of time, but I want to read it to you because I think it gives you an illustration of how you can witness to a Mormon that really is seeking, that really is ready, the ripe fruit. Um, you know, it's true that, that when we're out there on the streets, like Paul said, you know, some plant, some water, um, God gives the increase, some harvest. I've had the great blessing to, do, you know, be there for lots of harvesting. But there's a lot of seed planting too. But in this case, this woman, her name is Kara. She lived in uh, South Carolina. She was ready. God had been working on her. And so I want to, to read this to you. Uh, this is uh, on Saturday, um, late in the day. And she writes um, to Mark, I have been doing some soul searching. Maybe it was me, maybe it was him. For years now, questioning some things I've been taught my whole life. I'm 25 years old. Like a good Mormon girl should, I got married to an RM at 20. I now have two daughters, ages three and one and a very hollow, sad life. My first questions came when I was seven. My mom's friend was a minister at a Protestant church, but asked her if she would come and teach the children at her church how to sing the song, Jesus Loves Me. She took me along, and I was incredibly confused. The words were not like the ones we sang in primary. Jesus wants me for a sunbeam to shine for him each day in every way try to please him at home at school and play or i am a child of god you know he says teach me all that i must do to live with him someday and this one just said that jesus loves me and implied it was regardless of what i did 
I asked my mom about it on the way home. She said, we believe that too. So I didn't ask the question again. When I was 13, my sister was now 20 years old and was living a sinful life. She had been abandoned by my parents when she was 14 and now was supporting herself by living with a man in his 40s and by stripping at the local club. She only lived 10 minutes away from our house, but we never went to see her. We never called her. One day I asked my mom if we could go and visit her, and she told me I wasn't allowed to because we didn't accept the way she was living. I told my mother that I felt like that meant her love was conditional, and she explained it away. She said that her love was unconditional, just like Heavenly Father's. Uh, Heavenly Father always loves us, she said, but he abandons us when we are unworthy of him. And that's the same thing with Kim. And to me it made perfect sense, so I went with it. When I was 18, I learned in Institute that the Bible was translated incorrectly in the story of David, that when David repents of his sin of Bathsheba, he's not forgiven. He would have been if not for sending her husband to be murdered. I was taught that infidelity is only forgiven by God, and with at least a year of abandonment and church punishment, and murder is never forgiven by God. Well, I've never killed anyone. I was a virgin when I got married. I never smoked or drank or anything, but it bothered me that God, who created the world, isn't powerful enough to forgive murder. The story of Paul having been a murderer of the Christians and then repented isn't discussed in the Mormon faith. My husband was diagnosed with a form of autism in March and called Asperger's syndrome. He's unable to empathize with anyone's feelings, and he doesn't love me unconditionally. Um, I'm skipping a little bit. My parents never loved me unconditionally, but I'm a mother, and I love my daughters unconditionally in big letters. It's natural for me. I don't have to work too hard at it, really. And I believe if I'm able to love my daughters this way, then Heavenly Father should be able to love me that way, too. Regardless of whether I've... Whether, Regardless of whether or not I've had 100% visiting teaching or even if I've killed someone, my husband and I are now one week separated. I'm living with my mother and my girls. I drove past a Christian church today, and the marquee said, The only sinner God cannot forgive is he who refuses to come to him for repentance. And I felt like that message was for me, and I went online and found your site. I know I've been very long-winded, and I'm sorry, but I do have a few questions. Do you really feel Christ's unconditional love? I've taken off my temple garments, and I consider myself an ex-Mormon, but I don't feel like a Christian. I don't know how to be one. But if you tell me that you go to sleep at night and really feel like Jesus Christ's atonement is sufficient for all the dumb stuff you did that day, and really feel like he loves you and that there's nothing you can do to change that, if you feel peace that I want to be a Christian too. Sunday morning. Dear Kara, I cannot begin to tell you how your email stopped me dead in my tracks. It's Sunday morning and we're a part of the Evangelical Free Church here in Puyallup, Washington, so I have to leave on time to teach the junior high kids a Bible class. Some of them are here. They're not junior high anymore, I guess. <laughs> um, lost my place. So this will be a short email, but please stay in touch with me. I'm probably one of the few people who really know what you're going through right now, and I want to be um, of all the help I can. Yes, indeed, I have, uh, oh, the question, do I really feel Christ's unconditional love? The answer, yes, indeed, I have experienced and am experiencing the unconditional love of the king. It's like nothing else. It's that pearl of great price which is worth selling everything else to buy, yet it is free. It does not mean you have to get your act together and be a wonderful person before you're worthy enough for him. He wants to wash every sin from your record book for time and eternity, today, as a free gift. You just need to make the forever decision to say yes to that offer and really mean it. When you choose to trust in the finished work of the blood of his cross, your pardon is written in heaven forever. You have his promise at that point forward. Here it is. Truly I assure you, he who believes has eternal life. From John 6, 47. And no one can ever take it away from you. When God gives you a promise, no one, no authority on heaven or earth can take it away. After 34 years at that point, I, I can say triumphantly, it is the only way to live. He's my king, my lord, my savior, my best friend. It's not about a church. It's about him. Please write again. I'll write later tonight. So then she responds right after that at uh, 1 o'clock Pacific time. 
Thank you very much for responding. I, I feel very isolated right now. I tried talking to my mom about my feelings, but she just said that every young mother feels the way I do. But as my life becomes less hectic and full of sacrifice, my strong need for unconditional love will go away. I talked to my husband about it, and he does not want to hear about it. I told him how I was feeling, uh, but when I told him I wanted to go to sleep as an imperfect person and still feel accepted, loved, and worthy, he acted as if I had said I want to, I don't know, do something horrible. Anyway, your response was very appreciated because I do feel like I'm all on my own in this, like I'm all on my own, but I have no clue as to what I should do. Kara. Nine o'clock in the evening, same day. Kara. I have many people praying for you. Since we are on the other side of the country, I didn't think I was betraying any confidences to tell people at church about your email and ask them to pray for you. I showed your email to another ex-Mormon lady who goes to my church and tears flowed down her face as she read it. You are not alone. What you feel is valid and not unusual or strange at all. Your mother uh, said your strong need for unconditional love will go away. My goodness, God created all of us with a strong need for unconditional love. It's that God-shaped void that I mentioned on my website. If she has uh, suppressed that need in her own life, then she's the one who's dysfunctional, not you. Please be re reassured of that. On the other hand, I'm not suggesting that you take on your mother or husband and argue the point with them right now. I just want you to be reassured in your own heart that the Most High God knows exactly how he designed you. And as the scripture says, he saw that it was good. I'm not assuming that you claim to have no sin or fault. We all fail to be what we know God wants us to be. But the needs of your soul for the one who created you is as good and right a thing as is possible to be. He's drawing you to himself. He's calling you and holding out his pardon to you. He earned the right to offer you that unconditional pardon by taking your punishment on the cross and enduring the wrath of righteous justice because of your sin. Oh, the depth of his love for you, Kara. Unconditional does not even begin to describe it. This is not merely a touchy-feely kind of love that we conjure up for ourselves. Those were real nails that your sin and mine drove into his hands and feet. Those were real lashes that lashed open the flesh of his back and real thorns that you and I pushed onto his head. This is not cheap grace. Mercy is not robbing justice here. Rather, it is justice being fully satisfied. No higher price could have been paid for you. Yet even so, he will not force you to accept the everlasting pardon he's holding out to you. Can you imagine how amazing, how wonderful it is to be made eternally right with the Holy One? Even future sins forgiven? Yes, I've experienced being burdened under the yoke of Mormonism, and I've experienced being completely pardoned by the King of Kings. There is no comparison. I loved and respected my LDS parents, but I wouldn't go back to that hopelessness for all the riches in Fort Knox. In Mormonism, our future standing with Heavenly Father depends on our future ability to stop our sin. Do Mormons think he doesn't see our future failures? Hebrews 10:14. for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Um, in Romans uh, 5, um, God demonstrates his own love towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Notice what it does not say. It does not say that he loves us after we are worthy or after all we can do. He does not love us because we kept the first and greatest commandment to love him. Rather, 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. Now here's the thing, Kara. All the pain you're experiencing with the people in your life right now will grow strangely dim once you get things right with the Most High God. It's important that you make first things first. I urge you not to do battle with your family, but surrender to your Lord first. Let him love you. Believe his love. Believe his amazing promise. You won't have to take Relief Society classes to learn about his love. You will experience it. You won't need to reflect on many blessings to persuade yourself about his love. Rather, you will understand that everything you have and everything you are is a gift from his hand. All things are of him and through him and to him. You will understand that he did not create you for your ability to perform, but so that he could have an intimate relationship with you for eternity. When you choose to trust his love, it is yours. It's no longer a maybe. How do you know if you've made this decision? The scripture says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. 
Do you know for sure that you have everlasting life in Heavenly Father's kingdom? That your record book is clean? If you know that, then it means that you've chosen to believe. If you don't know that, then you are not believing. Because he promised it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's not a choice. Or it's a choice. It's not a feeling. A decision to trust. That's the kind of faith the Bible is talking about. Many Mormons have the, the mistaken idea that faith is a feeling or an emotion. No, faith does not always feel very good. Sometimes it's scary. Here's the best picture I can give you. When I was a little boy, my dad took me hiking and fishing often. On one occasion at age six, we were on a backpack trip in Kings Canyon National Park, fishing the Kings River for trout. At one point, we needed to cross the river where the river was slower, shallow, and broad. So my dad took the fishing gear in his hands and asked me to climb on his back as he waded across the knee-deep water. I trusted my dad, so I clung to him. As he waded across, the water was more powerful than we realized, and he staggered now and then as he stepped on round, slippery rocks, and the water pushed against his legs. I was frightened, but I did not change my decision to trust my dad. In fact, when I was scared, I clung to his neck all the more. I knew that I had no hope in my own power. If I let go, I would drown, so I chose to continue in my trust and hold on tight. Of course, we made it across safely. This is the choice before you. Either trust Joseph Smith, yourself, or trust in the blood of Jesus. If you make the choice to trust Jesus, I promise you that everything will change. It will amaze you what will happen, how God will change your life and cannot say exactly. He's forever surprising me, but there is not the slightest doubt in my mind that your adventure will begin and things will be different. Not necessarily easy, but wonderful. It's as simple as choosing to commit yourself to his pardon and telling him so in a prayer. Um, and then I've got a quote from uh, Romans 8 about, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Um, yes, how well I remember the primary songs, seemingly so sweet, so full of false teaching. You hit the nail on the head in describing them. Now I work with children a great deal, many times with unchurched kids at local fairs, telling them about how Jesus wants to forgive their I sometimes play my guitar and lead them in singing songs. I did this at a good news club after school club for kids at a local elementary school. And on the last club day of the school year, I was able to lead them in singing one last song. I told them, for our last song, I want to sing my favorite song in the whole world. Do you know what that is? In unison, they all grinned and proclaimed in a loud voice, Jesus loves me. They know me very well. It really is my favorite song. It's not just for kids, it's for adults too. If I were in South Carolina, I would sing it to you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. It's nearly 9 p.m. here, so it's almost midnight there. But perhaps you'll get this in the morning. I'll pray that God's love is poured out on you as I send it. 6 a.m., which would be 9 o'clock Eastern time, Kara writes back the very next morning. Dear Mark, I want to thank you, Mark, for being a true disciple of our Savior. Thank you for your contact and your words. I read your email first thing this morning, and I've got to tell you I was a little disappointed. You described a beautiful thing, but, it, but I didn't feel it, and I was worried that it might not be true. I kept reading your email over and over, waiting for some miracle, some wonderful feeling to come over me, but nothing happened. Then my children got up, and so I had to start my day. I kept reading your email in my mind, hoping for that change to happen, but the more I did, the less I could remember of it. And then while I was making breakfast, I realized that I couldn't remember what you had said except that you sang, quote, sang, Jesus loves me to me. So I started singing it myself. I started singing it very softly, like I was embarrassed or something. But I gradually got louder and louder. And then I remembered a second verse that I didn't know. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, and then the letters get bigger. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. 
I was laughing and I was crying at the same time, and I was singing as loud as I could. My one-year-old Madison was clapping and smiling. My three-year-old Emma Lee was trying to sing along. I gave them their breakfast and then went to my bedroom and knelt down to pray. Um, sorry. This is all I can say. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking my sins away. I love you too. But since then, I know I'm a different person. And it isn't a fake, made-up, youth conference, testimony meeting type feeling at all. It's a real light and a real joy. This is three hours later, I mean, or just a few hours later. A real joy. I looked over at my closet and realized I didn't feel any of the guilt I felt moments before about not wearing my temple garments or not going to church yesterday. Thank you for praying for me. I know you didn't save me. I know your email didn't save me. But thank you for showing me that Jesus, uh, showing me Jesus because he did save me. I will always love you for serving our Savior in such a simple, perfect way. I'm excited and joyful. I don't know what I should do next, but I'm willing to do whatever he wants me to do. 8.30 a.m., two and a half hours later. Kara, you just became a Christian in the ultimate sense of the word. I'm so glad that you didn't feel the Spirit when you placed your trust in Jesus. If you told me you had a burning in your bosom, I would have been worried. <laughs> Despite what Mormonism tells us, the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. In fact, our feelings can be very dangerous when we try to let them determine truth. Mormonism is very experiential. Everyone's always looking for a spiritual feeling or vision or dream. My sister in Idaho never stops, stops talking about such things. There's nothing wrong with feelings, but they should be de a response to truth, not a determiner of it. Likewise, peace is not a feeling. Peace is a condition, the absence of war or conflict. With the sin issue paid for, you finally have real peace with God because he can never compromise on sin. As you meditate about that fact, you will have waves of wonderful feelings, but the peace comes from the feelings about it. The fact of your pardon is based upon the promise of God, stated over and over in the word of God. Feelings have nothing to do with that truth. The Bible tells you so. But now that you know about the great transaction that has just occurred in heaven for you, just try to stop the feelings of joy. You won't be able to. The amazing love of God for you will overwhelm you. You will find yourself crying for joy at inexplicable times because his love is so immense. He emptied himself of his divine attributes, took on the limitations of human flesh, and left the throne to come and feel the pain and temptation and frustration and struggle and unkindness and insult. The list is endless. The king of the universe did this for Kara. Then he took it to the ultimate of torture and death, all because he valued a relationship with you so highly. There's much talk about the concept of self-esteem, but that idea is not biblical. Rather, it is God-esteem. Your value is not in your qualifications or performance, but in the fact that Jesus values you so highly. That is awesome because no circumstances of day-to-day -day life can ever take that away. The way this wonderful salvation, this wonderful forgiveness plays out from here is where the adventure begins. It's a literal love affair with the Most High God, except that you're not cheating on your husband to do it. In fact, what you will find is that as you walk with God, it will be the single most important thing you can do to restore your relationship with your husband and with your mother. Talk to Jesus, then listen to him by reading the Bible. His word is so full and you have so much to explore there. It will be a continual conversation with God. You will have a lot of unlearning to do as you go because there's so much Mormonism in your head. Give yourself the time to go through that process. For example, you're going to begin to discover who the God Almighty really is. He is so much more wonderful and awesome than Mormons ever dreamed. And then I quote another scripture, and uh, I said, How many ways has God given you his promise? Let me list a few here. And I have this long list of, of uh, verses. I have John 3.16. I have um, Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Um, Romans 10. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's a lot of others listed here as well. And uh, one of the later ones is the story about the, the uh, woman in Luke chapter 7. At the end of that, it says, Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you, past tense. Go in peace. Um, 
Hebrews 10 continues and talks about he who promised is faithful. And then the last paragraph here is, my wife Teresa commented that it is remarkable how you remembered the words to the second verse of Jesus loves me from so long ago. It's proof that God has been working in your life for a very long time, slowly drawing you to himself. I rejoice that I've been able to participate in his work of redemption in your life, but he is the author and finisher of your faith. All praise and glory go to him. I feel like I'm a midwife at a birth. Nothing I could do was going to stop it, but at least I got to help. I look forward to hearing about your next steps in faith. And then we did continue some emails um, talking about other issues, you know, the nature of God and so on. But uh, it was just one of the most remarkable things over this three-day period to have these kinds of email exchanges and to have it clearly laid out what the thought presses are. And when you witness to a Mormon who is a truth seeker out on the streets, there's going to be very similar thought processes going on. And you want to be rock solid on your own understanding that we are saved by grace alone. And we do works in response out of gratitude to him. Are they important? Absolutely they're important. But not to get saved. They're important because we are saved. And it's a way of showing our thankfulness to him. And we certainly would have no reason to want to sin. Do we fail? Yeah. Do we have our bad days? Absolutely. There's not a person, not a Christian who doesn't have a bad day. But don't ever think that that takes away your salvation. It doesn't. You are solid. There is nothing that can take that away from you. Like I told her, no bishop, no stake president, nobody can yank that from you. My own little brother once told me that... uh, you can't be forgiven of your sins. You're not even a member of the church. And I just smiled and said, you know what? He's the one that declared it to me, and he has authority to forgive sins, and you can't do anything about it. (laughs) Would you guys humor me a little bit? to close out by singing my favorite song. Can we stand up? Jesus loves me, this I know.